Hello and welcome back. In the previous lecture you learned how to customize your scene using lights and shadows and in this lecture we are going to have a look at how to place light sources in the 3D space with great precision and no effort. As you can see I've already set up some basic lighting conditions in our scene using an ambient light and a very dim directional light. And I've also added the two GLTF models that are going to work perfectly for the purpose of this lecture. So we have a traffic light on the left hand side and a suburban street lamp on the right hand side. I downloaded them from sketchfab.com and the author of both the 3D models is Gatsby. Ok, back to the live preview so we can get started. And let's say that you'd like to light up some specific parts of the 3D objects for which we have no information at all about their coordinates, like the red light and the light bulb. Well, in this case you can use and take advantage of the A-frame inspector that you can open by pressing Ctrl, Alt and I on your keyboard. And basically this is a visual tool for inspecting and tweaking the objects in your scenes. If you have a 3D modeling experience, you'll notice that it looks very similar to a 3D modeling software, so most likely you'll feel at home while using it. If you don't, I'll give you a brief overview of its UI and tools, so that you'll find the A-Frame Inspector easy to use, because its primary purpose is to improve your VR development experience. Ok, let's start with the viewport, that displays the scene from the Inspector's point of view so it has nothing to do with the A camera primitive. You can change the viewport with your mouse, so you can left click, hold and drag to rotate it. You can right click, hold and drag to pan it. And you can scroll the mouse wheel to zoom in and zoom out. On the left hand side you have the scene graph, which lists all the entities in our scene. And as you can see, some HTML elements include an icon, which represents the component attached to the entity. You can read more details about these components either by hovering the mouse over an icon, or by clicking on an entity. And doing so, you'll open the Components panel on the right hand side, which displays the selected entity's components and property values that of course you can modify according to your needs. And since the order in which the entities are listed in the scene graph mirrors the underlying HTML, you can see that for example this is the light component that I attached to the first entity to create the ambient light. And you can see these specific property values are here. Type ambient, intensity 0.2, together with all the other default property values of the light component. So the second entity in the scene graph is my custom directional light. And again you can also see these uh, vector values of the position component that by default is attached to any entity. In this case minus 0 0.5, 1 and 1. And so on. Therefore the sky, the ground, the camera and the two GLTF objects in my markup are listed in the same order in the scene graph. You can notice here that both the A sky primitive and the A plane primitive show their preset bundle of components that are the geometry and the material component. To select an object you can also click on it directly in the viewport. And to deselect any active selection, you can click on an empty area of the scene. The helpers surrounding any entity and the helper tools on the upper right of the viewport work exactly like the manipulator in Blender or the gizmo in 3D Studio Max. So again, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, 3D modeling software applications, I'll say that you can use these three arrows representing the X, Y, and z-axis to transform an object. And you can either constrain the transformations to a single axis, for example you can move an object along the x-axis only by left clicking and holding the red arrow, no matter the direction in which you move your mouse, or you can limit the transformations to two axes by left clicking and holding any of these squared areas, which represent the three possible combinations. So, X and Y axis only, 
y and z axis only or x and z axis only that for example is the most useful combination if you wanted to move the street lamp around making sure that it keeps sitting on the ground at the same height level you can also focus on an object by double clicking on it and you can perform a different transformations a change in the active helper tool so you can rotate and scale an object as well. By default the helpers match the global axis and this is quite evident especially when you rotate an object. Whereas if you check the local box the helpers will match the object's axis according to its orientation which can be quite useful depending on how you'd like to transform the selected object. Ok, I'm going to reload the page and open the A-frame inspector again so we can finally add our first light that is going to be the traffic lights red light so I click on the plus icon to add a new entity to our scene and I give the entity an ID, red light, that you can see displayed in the scene graph. Then I use this drop down menu to attach the light component to the entity. I set the type property value to point and I change its color to red. If I move this type of light around, you can see in real time how the objects in our scene are affected by its position, intensity, and distance. And keeping track of the light source position in the 3D space is extremely easy with the visual inspector, so you can place the entity exactly where you'd like to. When doing these adjustments you want to change the viewport frequently and constrain or limit the movement to specific axis. And then you can start adjusting the light property values. Let's say intensity 4, distance 0.4, and if needed you can do some final tweaking to adjust the light position finally all you have to do is uh, click on this icon to copy the entity's HTML and uh, paste the code to your document I'm going to rearrange it for the sake of readability And that's it. So if I now reload the page, you can see the result. Okay, let's move on to the street lamp and light up the light bulb. So I'm opening the visual inspector again. And since we need another point light, we can duplicate this entity. Then I modify its ID. And I move the entity to its new position. Again, when doing this, I change the viewport whenever I need to make sure that I'm placing the light correctly. 
And it might sound understood to 3D artists, but to achieve precise alignments, you need to keep the destination point at the center of the viewport. Then I modify its color. And here, if you don't know the exact hex color, you can use the color tool. I'm going for a golden yellow, like a double F, double C, double zero. Then I modify the light property values, let's say intensity two, distance of four, a slight adjustment to its height if necessary. Then I set the decay value to 2. And I finally copy the entity's HTML code and paste it to my document. We can delete this data brackets ID attribute that we are getting because of the live preview. Then I'll quickly rearrange the code. and reload the page to double check the result. Well, now we need to add the light cone cast by the light bulb. And as you learned in the previous lecture, you can do this with a spotlight. So I'm opening the visual inspector again. Then I duplicate the point light, so I'll have to make fewer adjustments to place it in the 3D space. I change the light type property value to spot, and I modify its ID, light cone. Then I change the distance to zero, so in this way the light will not decay with the distance. And I also set the decay and the intensity property values to 1, that is their default value, so they will not be included in the HTML that I'll copy later on. Now I rotate the spotlight around the x-axis by 90 degrees, so that the light cone will point downwards. Then adjust its position along the y-axis only, using the green helper. I set the angle property value to 45 and the penumbra property value to 0 0.3. So I'm finally ready to copy the entity's HTML and paste it to my document. As usual, I'm going to rearrange the code for the sake of readability. And I finally reload the page so we can see the result. Well, I'm quite happy with it. And as you could see, it's been quite easy to create and position our lights in a few minutes, and most importantly, with a high level of precision. Of course, you can use the A-frame inspector also to create and tweak different types of entities depending on which components you add to them. For example, to create a basic mesh, you can add the geometry component. I'll just type its name this time to quickly find it. So you can change its shape and property values depending on the type of primitive that you select. Say radius 0.5. And then, as you know, you can modify its appearance with the material component. Let's say color green. 
or can also modify all the other most useful properties of the material component that we covered in the previous lectures. So opacity, the shader, the side, or the normal map, the roughness or the texture properties, for example. But it's completely up to your preferences whether to use the A-frame inspector to create new elements from scratches or to use it just for some final tweaking. For sure it's an incredibly valuable tool when it comes to positioning elements that by their own nature are not visible in the standard scene, such as light sources, the camera, or uh, sounds. That is something that we'll have a look at later on in this course. So, with this lecture we have completed section 4 and you should now be able to modify the virtual environment in A-frame using a lot of different techniques to customize your scenes. In the next section we are going to talk about how to interact with the objects and I'll see you there.